Likute Sichais, Chele Kutches, Volume 18, the first Sicha for Parshas Masai. In this Sicha, the Rebbe will explain a wonderful medrash about the journeys of the Bnei Yisrael throughout the 40 years in the desert, which is discussed in our Parsha, and also its connection to our lives and to the history, the Jewish history, all the way until the coming of Mashiach. So in our parsha, it enumerates all the 42 journeys which they made in the desert. So the Medrash says on this, and in fact Rashi brings most of this Medrash, it gives us a parable. In the parable it says, what is this compared to? For a king whose son was sick, the prince was sick, and he traveled with him to a distant place in order to have him healed. As they were coming back, as they were returning, his father started to point out all the journeys, all the stops they made, and he said to him, here we slept, here we were cold, we like we caught a cold, here we cooled off, here you literally, it's translated, felt your head, meaning you had the headaches, you were a little ill. Says the Medrash, so too, Hashem said to Moshe, enumerate all the places in which they angered me, where the Jews, the Bnei Yisrael, angered me. This is the Medrash. And that's why it says, Eile Masei Bnei Yisrael, quote, these are the journeys of the children of Israel from when they left Egypt until they came to the Promised Land. So this is how the Medrash explains it. But there are several questions here. When we take a closer look, we understand that everything in the Torah is with absolute precision. So if that's the case, we need to understand not only this metaphor, this, this parable in its general sense, okay, but, you know, that somebody, that he was sick and that he had to be healed. I mean, why use that as an example? Why couldn't it just be a parable about a king traveling with his son? But also we have to go into the details. What is this thing about, specifically about the place that we slept, uh, the place where we cooled off, and the place where you were you had a headache where you felt your head okay and also we need to understand how this expresses best the moral of this parable how exactly does this connect to the moral of the parable where do you see the connection that's one question another question is we see in these three examples the Medrash gives these three examples for the entirety of all the travels, of all the journeys that they made, all the 42 stops. But this is only three examples. It doesn't say etc., so to speak, to give the impression this is only a short list of examples and there are more in the parable. Rather, this seems to be the sum total of all the examples. How can that be for all the stops in the 42 journeys? And also... Another question, if you think about it, the example of, you know, we got cold, we cooled off, or maybe you didn't feel well, you had headaches, you had your migraines, that in some way could, you know, can possibly be understood as a suggestion for the time you angered me, as a moral for the, you know, the, the nimshal for when the Jews traveled and they angered Hashem. But how is this first example of having slept in a certain place, how is that something negative? What's wrong with sleeping? You come to a place, you need to sleep. You can't travel 42 journeys, so to speak, without sleeping, without resting. So why would that be an example of something negative? Now, in addition to these questions, there are general questions in this entirety of this parable. And here it is. Hashem says as the Medrash concludes, that Moshe, I want you to enumerate, I want you to go over, to relist all the 42 journeys they made, all the stops they made throughout the years, in order to point out all the places where they angered me. The question is, we didn't anger Hashem in all these places. In many places, in many of these stops, wonderful things happened. And we don't have any record in the Torah for the Jews having made Hashem angry in those places. Neither they complained or they did anything wrong. They just happened to stop there and then they moved on. And there was nothing negative about it. So why does Hashem refer to all the journeys as having been 
uh, journeys that angered him. And then another question. If you look in the parable, what does it say? That when they were returning, when the king and his son were returning, Hashem pointed to each place and he said, uh, I mean, the king pointed to each stop as they were going on their way back and making the very same stops. So it implies, so it seems, he was pointing out that, look, this place, this is what you did, this is what happened here, this is what happened here. But here, they're not returning. They're not going back on all these 42 journeys. In fact, they're going forward. They're leaving these 42 journeys and going into Eretz Yisrael. So how is this a parable? How is this a mushal for why Hashem instructed Moshe to enumerate the 42 um, journeys. So in order to answer this, let's take a little analysis. If we analyze closely, we'll realize that the three examples in the parable, they actually correspond to the very first three stops or journeys that the B'nai Yisrael, that the children of Israel made as they left Mitzrayim up until Kriyas Yamsuf, the splitting of the sea. Look at the first stop. The first stop, the Torah tells us, they, they traveled from Ramses, that is from Mitzrayim, and the first place they stopped was in Sukkos. There, as Rashi tells us, they, quote, slept overnight. So you see the sleeping is a direct parallel to the first stop. In the second stop, they came to Asam. In Asam, that's where they began to enjoy the protection of the clouds of glory. What did the clouds of glory do? Not only protected them from the snakes and scorpions and from all the projectiles of the Egyptians, but in fact, we know that it also protected them from the heat of the desert, thus the cooling effect, thus the coldness. And the third one is when they arrived at Pihachiros. Remember when Hashem had them stopped here in order to confuse the Egyptians, and immediately they started to complain. And what did they say? We would rather work, we would rather be enslaved to the Egyptians rather than dying here, than being killed in the desert. This is a rationale. This is something that uses the head. Thus, the parable of the headaches, of using one's head. And you see clearly how these are the first, that corresponds to the first three journeys that they made prior to the splitting of the sea. Now, all these journeys in general, we know, are a symbol of all the journeys, just like they traveled until the city of Jericho, the city of Yericho. The word Yericho comes from the word Reach, which means smell. This is also a symbol for the general journeys of Am Yisrael from the beginning, from when we exit, from when we left Egypt, from the Exodus until the ultimate settling, until the ultimate entry into Eretz Yisrael, the coming of Mashiach which also has to do with smell. As we know that Mashiach will be the one to bring about the Geula, the redemption, and the final and absolute settlement in Eretz Yisrael. And Mashiach is the one, as it says, quote, he is Moirach Vadoin. He will be the one to judge by smell. He will be able to smell and know if something is true, if something is false, if something is good, if something is bad. It will be the absolute way of judgment. Thus, when they traveled, it all is symbolic of all the stops that we make throughout history, all the trials and tribulations of Am Yisrael until we reach the ultimate destination. In fact, the splitting of the sea is a micro example of what will happen when Mashiach comes. What happened to the in splitting of the sea? The evil, the bad, the Egyptians were done away with. They were killed. They were destroyed. They were annihilated. Thus, what will happen when Mashiach comes in a much greater level, in a macro level, that the entirety of all evil, of all darkness, will be done away with, will be totally killed, and there will be only good and only life. And this corresponds, obviously, to the coming of Mashiach, the splitting of the sea. So what does it come out from this? That since these three steps are only into the coming of Mashiach, uh, only into the splitting of the, of the sea, which is a symbol of Mashiach, then of course the question becomes more intensified. How are these three 
examples which only represent three parts, three steps in the journey, and only until the point of Kriya Syamsa, the splitting of the sea, how does this now become also representative of the entirety of the journey, of all the stops that we make, all the trials and tribulations, all the ups and downs that we have as Am Yisrael until we reach the ultimate time. So the question is not only about the three, the first three, but the question also is about the general descent. You see, what is really the whole idea of these journeys? What, what is really the whole idea in all of this? What, what's behind all of this? So if we take a look, if we better understand this, the idea behind all of this, the journeys that is, is as we know, it begins with the first journey that we ever take. Before even being in the world, before being in Egypt, before traveling through the desert of the nations. Now, why is it called the desert of the nations? It's called, euphemistically, the desert of the nations. Because just like the Jews tra travel in the desert, the desert is a desolate place. Or as described, a place, Adam, that man is not settled there. And when we mean man, we mean also the ultimate man, Hashem himself. This is in the general sense throughout all our journey, throughout all of history, where we're traveling through the trials and tribulations, we're traversing through all the nations, all the challenges that we have from the nations, and going through places, going through life, going through history with places that oppose the settlement, so to speak, oppose the existence of Hashem. And our job is to go through all of that, and our job is to come to the ultimate end of the journey, which is Mashiach. Where does this all begin? With the very first journey. The, the neshama, the soul, comes down from a place of light. It comes down from the greatest source of life into a place of death, a desolate place, a place that negates godliness, at least in the open, a place where you do not see the light the way it's seen up there, the way it's appreciated by the neshama before it comes down here and becomes confined to a body that lives in this world, that needs this world in order to exist. Why does this all happen? Well, we know this is all orchestrated by Hashem Himself. And this is the concept of Yerida Tzorech Aliyah, that there is a descent for the purpose of ascent. The greater the descent, the more the descent, the more the trials, the more the challenge, the greater the ascent, the greater the accomplishment. And the truth is that Chassidus takes it a step further, that not only is it a descent, a downfall, so to speak, but for the purpose of ascending later, but moreover, it turns out that in the Yerida itself, in the descent itself, in that moment of challenge itself, there is the greatest ascent, there is the greatest accomplishment. We just don't see it. It feels like something negative, but really it's the ultimate positive because it's happening by Hashem Himself. However, even though we know this, we could learn this and we could convince ourselves of this, but while we're going through that, quote, descent, while we're going through that challenge, while we fall, while we slip, while we get challenged by the world around us, in those moments, even though our minds can tell us that yes, remember, be aware of the fact that this is coming from Hashem, so this is a great thing in itself, but it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't seem that way. In that moment, the person is, is not behaving like a Jew, or the person is being restrained from behaving like a Jew should behave, like Hashem wants us to behave. Thus, that idea of all the journeys being a, a, an idea, an entity that, quote, angers him. Because you see, not only is it something that angers and displeases us, it feels uncomfortable, but so to speak for Hashem himself, in that moment, Hashem himself is, so to speak, even though he's the one who orchestrated it and he has a greater purpose in it, he himself, so to speak, is not happy with it, is not excited about it, is not, so to speak, content with it. So in that moment, it's as if it's also angering, quote, him every single step of the journey, every one of the 42 uh, stops in that journey. However, when Mashiach comes, 
when we reach the ultimate goal. And we're there already. And now we, quote, go back, not physically or literally go back, but now when we look back on each and every step of history, on each and every step of our history, of why our Nishama came down and why this challenge and that challenge and the other challenge, why every single one of these Yeridois, these descents, we will then have the perspective from Hashem's view. We will appreciate it. As it says in the Pasuk, one of the ultimate prophecies of Mashiach, Oitcha Hashem ki anaftabi. That when Mashiach comes and we have the proper vision, we have the proper perspective, we're going to quote, Thank you, Hashem, for you've inflicted punishment on me. Because then it will no longer be punishment. Then it will no longer be bad. We will see the absolute good that's in it. Think of it just as an example. These are my words, not the Rebbe's words. But think about even a time coming when Mashiach comes, when not only will the Holocaust be, okay, it makes sense, but it'll be something that we will celebrate, we'll appreciate why Hashem did it, and we'll actually be happy and thankful that it happened. Likewise, again, just to summarize, during the time it's happening, during the time of the journeys, the descent, quote-unquote, it's a time of lahachiseni. It makes me angry. Not only us, but it makes Hashem, so to speak, upset. He's not happy about it, although he's the one doing it because there's a deeper reason in there. But when we come to the time when we're on the other side and we're able to look back, that's where the mushal, the parable, tells us about going back and looking at each and every stop. Then we appreciate it. Then we're excited about it. How do we have the strength to go through all of these journeys and go through all of this difficulty and challenge, which as we said, in the time of the challenge, it's legitimately a challenge and a difficulty and a hardship. That's because in the parable, what do we see? The king didn't just send his son off, but he traveled with him. The king is there with you. Hashem is there with us. Not only is he there with us, but what is the whole purpose of the journey? Remember we asked why this example? To heal him. What is healing? To make something better. To make something even greater than where it is. To bring it better and greater health. <clears throat> Thus, that is the whole purpose of our journey. <clears throat> excuse me. To, to, uh, to where we're going. To the, to, to the ultimate destination, which is the coming of Mashiach. And now we can very well understand how the Yerida, the descent itself, is not only for the purpose of Aliyah, but how it's in Aliyah, how it's in ascent in itself. And now we can understand why these specific three examples and how they play a role. You see, because you can ask, if you think about it, the first three journeys, how were they negative? In other words, if we look at the rest of the journeys, talking about the, the, the other 39, the balance, the 39 journeys post the splitting of the sea and on until they arrived at where they are now at this point in our Parsha, ready to go into Israel, there we can understand perhaps that in the sum total, they are all the same. They all have a common thread, which is they angered Hashem because the Medrash says that Ilu Zohu, had they merited, had the Jews been in the proper standing and not having, having complained prior to the splitting of the sea, then they would have came out of Kriyas Yamsuf and not stepped on any dry land other than Eretz Yisrael. They would have walked, they would have just sprinted right in to Eretz Yisrael and never have to look back again. So we could understand how those 39 are, so to speak, the Yerida, they are our descent, they are our problem, so to speak. And we're saying that it all comes about because Hashem, so to speak, makes it happen, as we'll soon see. But how can we explain the first three being from Hashem? Or you can look at it vice versa. The first three we see directly are from Hashem, but how do we say the other 39, Hashem is dear with us and it comes from Hashem? So to other, in order to better understand it, there's a verse in Tehillim in the book of Psalms, in chapter 66, verse 5, that says, Noira alila al adam, which could also mean that Hashem makes schemes, amazing, wondrous schemes, tremendous schemes on the people of man, meaning that Hashem is the one who makes it happen so that a person should slip, that a person should be in a situation which unfortunately leads them to sin and therefore leads them to fall from their stature in order for them to grow even more from it later.
Or as we explained, the fall in itself is already a growth. Now, the truth is that if this is the case, then one can argue that this takes away free choice. Of course it doesn't. Because as the Mittal Rebbe explains, the second Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Dovber Lubavitch explains, that there are really two kinds, there's two different scenarios in this very idea that Hashem makes things happen. You see, there are, there are those which is clear and obvious. In other words, it's very direct. You see Hashem put a person in a certain situation. Hashem made a circumstance as it is, and it's very, very clear and obvious that the reason why the person, for example, is not doing a certain mitzvah is because they can't, because Hashem put them in that situation. Versus the other type, which is the typical one, where on the surface it doesn't seem to have a direct connection with Hashem. It's not obvious that Hashem made this person fall into that circumstance and slip and, you know, do the wrong thing only to later grow. And it seems to be clearly from the person's own personal choice, but still it's from Hashem. Because nothing happens without Hashem, and these things specifically comes all from Hashem, that Hashem has a plan for each and every single person. Thus, we can appreciate the difference between the first three journeys, which was prior to the splitting of the sea, which the splitting of the sea technically could have been already the time of Mashiach, to go in straight from there to Eretz Yisrael, and the other 39 journeys. You see, the first three of those type where it's obvious. Hashem brought them to where they are. Hashem made happen what happened. But then after the splitting of the sea, like I said, because we didn't merit, because of our shortcomings, because of our insufficiencies, therefore we had to go through all of that. So it seems to have been triggered by us. It seems to be our fault, but really ultimately it comes all from Hashem. It all comes from Hashem. And all of them, the common thread between everything is that it all is ultimately not only for the purpose of ascent, for the purpose of being greater, but in and itself is already a greatness. We just don't see it. We'll only get to appreciate all of this after Mashiach comes. And now we can get a little better appreciation of these specific three examples in the parable. You see, the idea of sleeping. Remember we spoke about the neshama coming down to this world. And that's in the each person's individual, particular journeys. And then in general... Am Yisrael, us, the children of Israel, being in the world and having to live amongst the nations in, quote, the desert of the nations and going through all of that. So when you look at the idea of sleeping, what is the idea of sleeping? We know that sleep is to a great degree considered a measure of death. It's like death in some ways. It's just that we get to wake up afterwards. Thus, think about the neshama. The neshama is in the ultimate place of life, in the ultimate source of light in life. When it comes down into this world, it descends into a place that there is an option for one to choose the opposite of life. God forbid death. Thus the idea of sleeping. However, even though the neshama comes into a very dark place, but as the Torah tells us, Hashem also says, I give before you life. That means I also give you the counterbalance to the death, to the bad, to the evil, to the darkness of the world. There, so you should be able to choose. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to choose the good. This is the, quote, cooling off idea. This is the good that we have, the life, the Torah, the spirituality that's available to us, that's dear, but we just need to you know, tap into that resource, but it's dear and it can help us cool off the severity of the darkness of the world, of the passion for material things. However, in order for us to have true and absolute free choice, Hashem gave us intellect. The intellect is what gives us the, it gives us the animalistic soul. It gives us the ability to think, to contemplate, and you can use your head. Sometimes it, does, it don't use it right. That's not feeling good in your head. Sometimes we use it right, hopefully the more times. This is where we have the ability to overpower our emotions, our instincts, our temptations. This is captured in the example of where Hashem says, in these places you felt your head. That means you were slightly ill with your head. The Talmud tells us that a michush, 
Michush means just not feeling a little bit, is not an outright sickness, is not an ailment. Okay, there's a difference in an illness and just not feeling a little well. When you don't feel a little well, okay, it's not a big deal. Sometimes you just, you know, go, you lay down a little bit, you rest, you relax, you feel better. If chas v'sholom, someone's sick, someone's ill, that's a whole different story. So likewise, when our mind goes back and forth and we're thinking to do the right thing, not to do the right thing, that gets captured in this category, in this example, this parable of you felt bad in your head, you had a headache. And this is the sum total of this whole parable and parable and the moral of how it applies to our times and to the coming of Mashiach.